Lost Property, Chapter 8. Okay, so we begin the chapter here um, with the, just a bit of a you know, reminder of what happened to Mum and, and the fact that she had that breakdown and Hayley is now really worried about what is happening to Mum. Josh then goes on to uh, to work back at the Lost Property office and we come across Mr Bale who has come in just uh, to check how things are going. And, in, and during that time he does uh, speak of, of um, Josh's father. Great bloke your dad, Josh. I was a fan of his back when he was a boy. In fact, I was at Cogra the day he scored that famous hat trick. You've heard all about that, I suppose. Well, of course, Josh actually has. Um, the discussion then goes on to um, the preparation for the for the sales, um, and also again a little bit of a banter about uh, about Dad. Towards the end, Clive basically says, "You don't mind, don't mind, Peter. He's just a, a big fan of your dad's." Josh replies, "Oh, I don't mind." kind of makes me feel like a celebrity too. When I was nine or ten, Dad would take me with him to watch my brother play. Total strangers would come up to us on the sideline and ask, are you Phil Tambling from St George? It was only embarrassing when a guy called Terry Vickers came with us because he'd seen every game Dad played and he'd go on about what fools the selectors were for never picking Phil Tambling for the Australian team. I'll bet that you... Made, I bet that made you proud of your dad, though, eh? My turn to smile somewhat sheepishly. Yeah, pretty proud. I don't think dad liked being recognised much, but when people asked which player was his son, dad was happy to point him out. That was when dad looked proud because Michael was a good player, captain of the under-15s one year. Okay, so for Josh, being the son of a celebrity football player doesn't you know, it doesn't really phase him, it doesn't bother him at all, he's kind of been used to it and, and he just accepts it. And then we go on to do the bit about Dad, and again, remember how we said Dad was very humble, he's not very egotistical, he's not so much worried about his own celebrity status, but he's very proud of what his, what his children do. And here, when Michael was playing, he was very, very proud of him. The conversation then turns uh, where Clive asks Josh, well, do you play footy as well? And down the bottom, Josh responds, To tell you the truth, Clive, I'm not much of a chop as a footballer. I don't know why I keep playing, really. So again, we find out, just like Chapter 1, Hayley, Michael, got all the sporting genes. They're sporty people. Uh, Josh, not so. He doesn't really go for playing footy much. So he says, I don't know why I keep playing. And then continues in a very interesting statement. No, that was a lie. I know exactly why I keep playing. It's because of Dad and how disappointed he was when Michael gave it away. Halfway through year 11, knocking on the door of the firsts, he suddenly says he doesn't want to play anymore, so I keep playing. Now, this might sound like a bit deja vu. In other words, we've heard this before. And we have heard the same comment before. I don't know why I keep going to church, if you recall. Well, why do I keep going? It's because of Dad. Michael stopped going and dad was really disappointed so I didn't want to make him feel that way again. So Josh only goes to church so his dad's not disappointed. Josh only plays footy so that his dad won't be disappointed because Michael gave it up, his father was disappointed so Josh keeps playing so that you know he doesn't hurt him again. So Michael's, the effect of Michael, now do remember at this stage Michael really isn't in the picture. We are hearing everything about him, but as yet we haven't met the person. We haven't met Michael. We There's no sort of you know tale about what's happening to him now. This is all sort of what used to happen. But Michael is a tremendous influence in this first section of the novel. And the influence is by his absence. So he's causing a lot of distress to the family. And he's also causing Josh to keep doing things that he doesn't want to really do for the very reason he doesn't want to disappoint Dad like Michael did. So just thinking about that as, as we go through. Okay, so, um, at, you know, continuation of the day and the, you know, getting ready for the auction and then Josh actually notices something about Clive. And this is in this green section here on the page. I was about to turn away when I saw him pick up an item from the shelf. The way he was quickly intrigued by it caught my eye. 
Though his back was to me, I could tell he was holding it in front of him and studying whatever it was carefully. It wasn't a camera I'd seen that much. What was it? A necklace or another brooch? Whatever it was, once he tagged the item, he didn't put it back. He slipped it into his pocket instead. And then, you know, Josh notices that there's a bulge in the pocket. Clive then goes over to the compactus um, to do whatever, and it comes back. And what he actually notices, Josh notices that when he returns from the compactus, the bulge in the pocket, in other words, where that item was that he put it, is gone. And Josh becomes a little bit curious, I guess, as to what's happened to it. Did it go into that mysterious suitcase? And he gets his chance to have a look when Clive says, Josh, I'm popping the downstairs to sort out a few things. Shouldn't be more than 20 minutes. Perfect chance. As soon as he was gone, I headed for the compactus, wrenching the wheels over like a helmsman turning a fleet of battleships. There was the suitcase, not hidden in any deliberate way, but simply out of place among the collapsible prams, bassinets and the vague stink of Bobby, uh, a baby's vomit. With the suitcase flat on the floor, I put my fingers over the spring-loaded latches to kill the sound when they flicked up. I was half expecting a pirate's chest of jewellery, but at first glance there was no jewellery at all, just some boxes and a large book. Only when I picked up the book did I see the words in flaked gold lettering. Holy Bible. Next to it was a music box. The classic girly toy, I thought at first, but it was much heavier than expected and a closer look showed it was made of some expensive wood with silver plated hinges and handles. The second box must have belonged to an artist because it held, tu held tubes of paint and a collection of brushes bound up in a dirty cloth. Once I had these things out on the floor beside me, I saw what was going on. They were camouflage. A tea towel had been laid underneath them, and when I pulled it away, there was the valuable stuff. Necklaces and another brooch and a diamond ring still in its box. There were a few rings, in fact. None of them cheap junk like Melanie Stewart wanted me to give Alicia. They would all bring decent bids to the auction. But that was just it. None of this was going to the auction, was it? Scattered among these were some pens, all expensive looking, either fountain pens with the tortoiseshell casings or elegant gold and silver affairs engraved with a name. One inscription said, Writers Write. The rest of the space was taken up by bulging envelopes stacked against the hinged side of the suitcase. Were they full of jewellery too? My hand reached forward, but before I picked up the first one, a gaudy yellow and and black colours of Kodak told me what they were. So they were photos. Okay, so what had Clive added to the collection? So what he has discovered is he has discovered a suitcase with all these valuables items in it. And of course, it starts to you know, make him quite inquisitive as, as to what it was. Um, my fingers were picking um, aimlessly among my necklaces and chains when I sensed a figure standing in the passageway beside the compactus. Oh, shit. I reeled back onto my heels, worried that Clive might take a swipe at me. He was moving forward towards me, but not for that. Ignoring the tea towel, he dropped the Bible, the music box and the set of paints on top of the rest and simply closed the lid. These items are nothing to do with you, Josh. Forget you ever saw them. There's hundreds of, hundreds of dollars worth of stuff in here. The jewellery should be in the safe. Leave it, Josh. Don't interfere, he said firmly. It wasn't a threat or even a warning, but the command of a 60-year-old who expected to be obeyed. Okay. So Josh has discovered a bit of a mystery. And, um, of course, once he's sort of saw that, his mind now starts wandering. So on his way um, home that afternoon, I barely saw the stations go by. Clive was hiding valuable items, hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars worth. I didn't want him to be a thief, but the evidence was clear enough. Now, can we just stop here for a minute and have a look at the words that Josh is actually saying to himself, okay? 
I didn't want him to be a thief. What he is doing is he is immediately making an assumption about something that he saw. He hadn't asked Clive what was going on. He didn't know anything why they were there. But immediately the word thief comes into his head, which means that's the way he's seeing Clive. Without any proof, mind you. Okay. Josh continues. It seemed like an odd way to steal things, but as I thought about it, I started to see why. He had to be patient, had to wait and see whether the owner turned up at the counter to claim the lost property. Everything here came in from suburban stations. There were records and Clive couldn't be sure that the person who came looking for an item didn't already know it had been handed in. He'd be in real trouble then if he had pinched it. But so much of the lost property we handled was never claimed and who would know that better than the people who worked here every day? Clive was smart. He picked off the items and obviously no one would come asking for them and then he could quietly play around with the records. Look at the way the items were bundled together downstairs before the auction. Easy for things to go missing, get mixed up, lost all over again. Okay, his mind is actually wandering. And then Josh goes, continuing. How did he sell it? When that con man tried to claim a digital camera, Clive had talked about doing a deal in a pub. That must be it. He knew because that's exactly how he did it himself. What a grubby life he had. He probably made an extra thousand dollars every year out of this scam. But forget the money. It was the shock of finding out that got to me. I quite like Clive. The way he treated that guy who'd lost all his connections had been something special, something that glowed. Now this. I was gutted by it, as though he had opened me up with a carving knife and emptied me out. I know we're at the end of the chapter, but what I want you to think about here is look at the words that Josh is using. What a grubby life he had. Um, How did he sell it? He's making extra thousands of dollars. And and notice these words. It was the shock of finding out that got to me. I like Clive before. Well, I don't now. Um, Can we just sort of stop and think? The shock of finding out what? All he did is open up a suitcase and see a number of items in it. That's, those are the facts, okay? That's all he saw. And from that one moment, his imagination has gone into overdrive and he is turning Clive into a a, a thief and, you know, saying what a grubby life he had. No, without even knowing anything else. He is automatically making assumptions. Remember also when he saw that uh, second man that came in for the camera and the bag and and the way that he looked, how he assumed what kind of a horrible person he was just based on his looks? Well, he's back into assumption mode again. Is this true? Is Clive a thief? Is he really stealing? We don't know at this stage, but is it right to make such assumptions? I'll leave that to you as we finish this chapter.